Coming up on Digital Music Trends 226 on the 1st of April 2015, a show entirely devoid of April's Fool's jokes as we talk extensively about Tidal's weird launch, PlayStation Music going live and the future of music on consoles, the Sync Summit, Coachella's YouTube stream, plus an interview with the founder of Sync Tank. This week's show is brought to you by Gramophone, a small device that can turn your traditional sound system into a Wi-Fi music player. The Gramophone relies on your home Wi-Fi rather than on Bluetooth, which allows for higher sound quality. You can send your music to the Gramophone right from the Spotify app. And from that moment, the device will bypass your phone and stream directly from the Spotify servers, which means that your phone won't run out of charge and you'll be able to receive notifications and calls without interrupting your music experience. We thank them for the support of Digital Music Trends. Check out the website on gramophone.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and uh, DMT is available on a variety of platforms but if you want to grab it and uh, consume it on the go you can also you can download it as a podcast uh, uh, on many uh, on any really of the podcasting platforms that are out there and uh, you can uh, effectively download it and, and uh, listen to it even without a network connection. So if you are a subscriber on, on YouTube or SoundCloud that you might want to check Check out that option if you find yourself wanting to listen to the show while you're commuting or, or in other places where you might not have a connection. And uh, this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome two great guests uh, to the show. Uh, first of all, uh, Mark Frieser, the founder of uh, uh, Sync Summit. So hi, Mark, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Oh, very good. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here, Andrea. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you. And we're going to talk about the Sync Summit uh, coming up in London uh, for sure during the show. And uh, also, it's a, a real pleasure to welcome back Channel Coyle, uh, the uh, founder of co-founder of uh, Music Geek Services, uh, which is an artist uh, services company based in Chicago and Nashville. And Chandler also teaches music business classes at Berkeley's online courses. So hi, Chandler, and thanks for joining us. Hello, thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure to have you. And this week, uh, uh, we have quite a, a few bits and bobs to talk about, but really everything is going to revolve around Tidal. And, and really, if you thought that we were not going to talk about Tidal, uh, well, you were mistaken, uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, what else is there to talk about this week, really? It's, it's kind of uh, uh, the name of the game, and uh, uh, we've seen so much press, press coverage, uh, uh, both uh, uh, industry-led and mainstream, uh, on, on, this, uh, on this announcement. And so, uh, first of all, let, let's start by talking about the press conference itself around Tidal. So very briefly, in case you haven't seen it, uh, people are listening or watching uh, the show, uh, uh, this uh, service that has been acquired just a few weeks ago by Jay-Z uh, has, uh, uh, was relaunching, essentially, uh, on, on Monday, and the press conference uh, was preceded by a big countdown, uh, and uh, it all started at 10 p.m. London time, which was highly inconvenient for us here in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, essentially, it, it was pretty impressive, because when it started out, uh, you know, you saw Madonna, Jay-Z, Kanye West, and Calvin Harris, Rihanna, Nicki Minaj all sort of come up on stage. Chris Martin, Alicia Keys come up on stage and it felt like a big thing. Unfortunately, they managed to get all these people there, ma managed to clear their schedules to make time for the announcement, but they didn't actually think about what they were going to say. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, that was the, the kind of the key issue there. And Alicia Keys made a kind of relatively incoherent speech about the power of music and everybody else just kind of looked awkward and stayed silent on stage until they signed a declaration that we didn't really know what, what it said. We only found out later. And, uh, and, and then they walked off stage and that was it. Uh, you know, the, they could have done a lot more with it, really, considering the caliber of people they had on on there, they're entertainers. Uh, I mean, come on. And, and so, uh, first of all, yeah. let's talk about that. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, 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 the weirdest press conference, right, for, for the caliber of people they had on stage. Well, I mean, I think it was very strange, just in general, and I'm, I'm not very impressed with title to begin with. I mean, it's, uh, I, I mean, I don't know what you think, Chandler, but it's really old wine in uh, new bottles as far as I'm concerned. Nobody's actually talked about what the business end of this thing is. Okay, so Jay-Z has invested some money into something that's sort of been languishing as a second-rate streaming service. Okay, it has lossless quality, which we can get to whether or not, you know, the, you know, basic people... Uh, you know, who listen to Spotify really care about that that much. But at the end of the day, you know, for me, it always goes back to the splits. And maybe that's because I work in music licensing. Absolutely. But, you know, the, the problem with streaming is that it's inherently broken for the artist. The artist is not getting a good payout. And there was nothing to indicate that this was going to change it just because, you know, uh, Jay-Z is able to get his friends together to uh, have a nice press conference and to uh, put their music on his service. So, I, I mean, overall, I'm not very impressed. Yeah, Chandler. What were your, you know, first thoughts when you when you saw the video? Because you watched the live like, like, like I did. Yes. Yeah, I watched the press conference, and you know, from looking at just the 
press conference, it was, you know, very awkward. Uh, you know, I come from working more with emerging artists and, and, you know, bands that would take Berkeley online courses and smaller bands and looking at all those people on the stage, the only one that those artists could identify with would be Arcade Fire. Yeah. And, and depending on when you discovered Arcade Fire, they still seem like a small band. They're still affiliated with Merge, I believe. But they're huge. They're playing stadiums and <laughs> hockey arenas. They're one of the largest touring bands, you know. So the, the thing about, I think that, you know, you also, as an emerging artist figures out, is these artists are getting an equity stake in this company. Mm -hmm. He gifted them. Uh, one thing I read was at three percent each or something yeah, that like was, that. That was what was reported by Billboard, although unconfirmed, right. I think. Yeah. So, yeah, I and the other thing is, as a music listener, like I haven't tried Tidal because it's inconvenient. I'm I'm on Beats because I was on Mog and I didn't right. like Spotify. I use Sonos Beats. I pretty much just open it up and what. You know, nine times out of ten, one one of the playlists that they suggest, I'll listen to. Right. So Tidal doesn't have enough over me. And these are the things I listen to music in these days. Um, so the the flack, and the other thing is, like, bandwidth. Like, yeah. I'm not going to stream flack uh, while I'm out walking. On, <laughs> you know, my, I'll yeah, hit my guys, bandwidth limit. You guys have caps in the U.S. I mean, in Europe, it's yeah. not as much of a problem. But at least in the U.K., the UK we're quite lucky in, in terms of caps. But uh, I, in, I have, <laughs> yeah, I have heard, like, I wanted to poo-poo the, the quality. Like, it's not going to matter. But two people I trust um, said it it's noticeable. Like, right. you'll notice it. Now, maybe when I'm at home and I, I assume that, you can stream flack through Sonos and, you know, you can notice the quality, but it's really, it boils down to convenience. And right now title is, you know, the exclusive don't excite me. Uh, <laughs> so for the, so as thinking as the average music listener and someone who doesn't really want to go try a lot of services just to try them, I don't need to try these services. I don't need to be checking out title. And right now, even as a music fan, I don't need to be checking out title. Yeah. I, I'm, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. It's, yeah. I think the one thing that people need to look past is, is you know, like they're disrupting. They, they sort of came out of nowhere. So we, we thought it was going to be Spotify versus Apple. Right, yeah. But, yeah. but now Tidal is getting a lot of attention. So I wonder, like, is there any sweat on the brow of Tim Cook and Ian Rogers and Jimmy, you know, and Dre? Or are they looking at this and going... We got this. Yeah. And there's a bunch of different issues that, that you highlighted there. So first of all, let's talk about the quality of the sound cause, uh, and the price, because there's two things that are, are tied together. So a lot of, a lot of uh, articles that I read uh, were focusing on the fact that, come on, nobody's going to pay $20 a month uh, or very, very few people for the uh, sound quality that is offered by Tidal. One of the big things that was actually uh, part of the announcement but wasn't really announced is the fact that when Tidal launched as a separate company as part of Aspiro back in October, uh, uh, around the world, uh, uh, there was no uh, Spotify you know, there was no tier that was competitive to Spotify's offering. So everything was uh, $19.99 in dollars or pounds. Uh, you could only access the premium service. And the, the fact that this week they've actually opened up the service to the lower quality tiers, which wasn't available before, is quite interesting because it means that it, it creates a level that is at the same level as Spotify. So to, to a certain extent, the argument of like some, some, some articles I read where they're like, you know, it's doomed because of the price point. The price point is the same as the one on Spotify. It's essentially similar to, to Beats in the sense that uh, there's no free tier but you can start by paying 9.99 per month uh, and so, so th that's an interesting thing you know do you think that people are cottoning on mark to the fact that this is kind of similar to spotify as an offering and and that the 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 added high sound quality thing is just an, an add-on really it's not it's not compulsory i mean look you know i think at the end of the day it comes down to it i mean yeah i mean for somebody like me you know okay i'm listening to this on what like some like what are they soul so they're they're <laughs> made by uh the guy who spouted monsters uh uh son and then i've got a pair of akgs which actually sound pretty good yeah. now at the end of the day for me for somebody who's in the music industry as an audiophile it's going to make a difference in terms of lossless quality yeah. but in terms of what i get on spotify really the reason that i go on spotify and the reason that I go on any service, and Mog is another one, you know, is, is the amount of choice that I'm getting. 
you know, at the ease of usage. You know, it's this amazing thing for me as a consumer yeah. that I can get almost anything that I want for a really low price. I mean, I think I'm paying $10 a month and I can download what I want as long as I'm a subscriber. And the quality is good enough so that when I'm walking around, when I'm in a car, it's good enough so that as a basic consumer, I get what I want. So, you know, really, I, I, if if I'm looking at Tidal, other than the fact that they've got some exclusive content, I'm still trying to figure out what the value add is going to be for me in the short term to say, you know what, right. I'm going to drop down to $20 and uh, give it a shot. Yeah, and and the second big issue is obviously, uh, as you highlighted, Chandler, is, is the issue around uh, the idea behind it to, to a certain extent because you know you know there, there there was a certain ideological stance that came with the launch of the service uh, and the fact yep. that they were that they, they were launching the service by signing a declaration uh, uh, it was interesting although the declaration doesn't actually say anything s s substantive uh, uh, really it's it's kind of like empty empty words to a certain degree uh, but but the fact that it all came from this ideological s stance and then it, it looks like essentially uh, they gave uh, if, if the rumors are true about the 3%, they gave uh, essentially a minority stake, uh, but a substantial stake to the artists that are, uh, jumped on board first thing. And then the rest of it is owned by uh, uh, sort of Jay-Z and, and a bunch of other investors. Uh, right. There is no space left for anybody else. So at that point, uh, can they really offer better rates to, to artists uh, if that's the model? Uh, and, and how are they going to do that if Spotify is already struggling? You know, it's not struggling, but you know, it's, it's finding it hard to break even worldwide just because of the costs of streaming and, and licensing. Uh, th that's sort of my big question mark. Because one of the things that was interesting about uh, Aspire was that they had actually partnered with the university, and I, I forget the name of the university right now, but they commissioned, the, they essentially collaborated with this, this group of researchers on, on a big study. Uh, uh, it was Arndt Mazo actually uh, that uh, uh, the person that uh, that sort of uh, spearheaded this in, uh, this investigation and uh, um, essentially the the issue they were looking at was the, the royalty payment. So what this university looked at was whether there was a possibility of perhaps creating a different way of distributing money that uh, allowed you to for example, if if you listen to only one artist or two or three artists uh, during a month, you know the seven dollars out of the ten dollars that you you pay to Spotify uh, or to to Wimp, uh, you know instead of going to all of the artists and and the artists you listen to only getting zero point zero zero one, uh, those artists actually would get the share of the pie of the seven dollars that were paid out. So that was a really interesting proposition, but but we're not seeing anything of the kind here. So, uh, Mark, do you think that this is kind of a, a, an ideology without ideology and kind of like just pretending that they're they're taking control back but actually just retaining control uh, in a similar way to, to you know to how uh, uh, services and labels are behaving well I mean I'd love to hear Chandler's take on this but basically my you know my take on this is like I said at the beginning it's uh, it's it's old wine and new bottles there you know nobody's no, the regular artist first of all isn't going to get an equity stake of anything let alone three percent right. you know because you're not right. Alicia Keys you're not somebody who is a guaranteed hit maker no offense to people that are coming up but I mean that's the bottom line so at the end of the day, you know, when they're looking at something, uh, it's, it's a really nice press release, but when it comes down to the heart of the matter, in the long term, there needs to be a restructuring, I think, in general in streaming, and maybe this is part of this conversation or another, but there needs to be a restructuring, I think, in, in streaming and maybe the pricing of it to the consumer in order to make it really work in the long term. But, um, you know, the biggest thing that I can say about Tidal in terms of the actual business uh, portion of it is that it was noticeable in its silence that there really wasn't any talk about it. So, right. you know, I don't think that there's any, any significant change coming out of it. Yeah, yeah, and, and Chandler, uh, from, from your end, obviously you work with a lot of artists and a lot of students. Uh, uh, do you think that this was a missed opportunity for uh, the the artists that were involved to create something that uh, the wider community uh, of creators could have felt uh, involved in, in or, or you know, s somehow uh, a part of? Yeah, I, th I think the missed opportunity was to involve some indie artists. I mean, that's the obvious thing. But but I think the ide ideological angle is sort of pointless with the fans yeah because i you know separating you get outside the inside baseball element that that we care about get outside the artist element and ask the 21 year old college student if they care <laughs> that this is an artist owned service and the answer will be what i don't know what you're talking about. who cares yeah you know i i imagine that the super fans of arcade fire who care about arcade fire will check out title but mm -hmm. you know 
and it really you know comes down to I'm not switching to title even for the the high quality because I'm satisfied with I what I have on beats and and my playlist that I've made on beats and and the the trust that I have in their curators and just sort of the faith that Apple hasn't let me down yet. <laughs> that, <laughs> just, you know, that, just, that, you just wait. You just wait. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I, I, let's just say that they're setting themselves up to fail big time. You know, it's like, it's got to be really good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, but I, I think the ideological thing was, it was, it was, they used the wrong people. Yeah. You know, it, it, my question is, you know, thinking back to 1999 when Sean Fanning was building uh, Napster. He solved the problem that his demographic, you know, the college students who were essentially now on YouTube were having back then. Yeah. So if you make things inconvenient, if you take away the free tier, as, as it looks like it's going to be happening, I don't think people will go to piracy, but you got to wonder who's planning what. I know it's, yeah. it's, you can't compare it because it was easy to just download MP3s and, you know, sort of like go in, dip into the well and, and run away. Streaming, I don't think could be open sourced, but you know, I I have you know something. My big concern with artists that I want want to put on the table is uh, the data. You know, the it, this the the lip lip service that Spotify is uh, you know giving in terms of we're we're giving you a lot of analyt analytic data. But really what the artists want to know, especially emerging artists, is be able to contact the fans and, and right. be able to, uh -huh. you know, at, ideally, it would be nice if uh, an artist could offer something in exchange for an email address or the ability to message fans directly. And yeah, that's yeah. sort of the elephant in the room that no one's talking about. I mean, Pandora's amp, it, yeah. it isn't quite there. Spotify, Beats tried... You know, they, they're even putting pledge music offers inside of Spotify through, through Bandpage. Yeah. But, you know, I think that Dark Horse and at least the emerging artist uh, landscape is noise trade. And what they plan to do is people stop downloading tracks. What are, noise trade ceases to exist if people don't want MP3s, you know, because the exchange is email for download. Well, they have to be planning something next, and that's what I think is going to be interesting to watch from the from the emerging artists. But title is like it's it's like oh great, you know they're uh, the too. artists own it. But yeah, yeah, I heard I heard uh, the Upward Spiral podcast mention uh, there was a Kyle Boleyn and Courtney Harding were talking about like I think it was Kyle who said you know Spotify's been trying to crack this nut. With artist payments for for what? How long? Eight yeah. years? Six? Yeah. Yeah. Seven years? And they haven't. So what makes us think that Title's going to do it? Giving away forty eight percent of you know the equity to sixteen artists or seventeen artists, and you know not having an advertising tier. Where's their revenue going to come? I would love, I, I really hope that whoever drafted those agreements uh, made those shares dilutable because when, yeah. they run, when, when they run out of money and they have to get new investors on board, uh, that's not going to fly. The fact that 48% of the company is given for free to 16 artists. So we're going to you, you, have to see how that, how that works out really in the long term. Agreed. <laughs> you got to wonder if this stake is like a going to expire. Like yeah. they may have given equity for the five years of, of I don't know, like... Somehow, it's just I just can't see him giving away half his company. No, yeah, it sounds like too much. It might not even be true. I mean, we haven't really heard an official report right. about this. And uh, about, but you know, there's so many questions here, and I think we could talk about this for the, for the rest of the show. But uh, I think we should probably move on. You know, some of the questions around, uh, as you said, you know, the, the percentages and, and what's going to happen to the money and uh, how they're planning to promote the service. There's so much happening. Of course, the partnership with Sprint that we haven't even mentioned yet. Uh, there's so much to, to touch upon, but we really won't know much uh, until we get the next numbers if they're ever released again because Aspire obviously was a public company so we knew a lot about what was happening inside it and, right. and uh, Mark uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the Sync Summit so uh, uh, Sync Summit happening in just a week in London oh my god it's like it's around the corner uh, it really uh, <laughs> is it really is and you know um, basically for people that don't know about 
for people that don't know about the Sync Summit, I'll give you a very succinct uh, sort of uh, sure. background. We've been doing it since uh, 2013, and the reason that uh, I had, uh, began the Sync Summit is that I also work in the area of music licensing for visual and interactive media projects, and uh, I felt that there wasn't an event that really brought together the people to really break it down to its essence on the buy side and the sell side, and the sell side means labels, publishers, managers, artists, producers. On the buy side, it means music supervisors, agencies, and brand managers. To bring them together where they can have a real dialogue, not just, you know, sit down for 10 minutes, show me your music, give me a CD, but really have a conversation about the creative, the process, best practice aspects of the business, share intelligence, ed get educated, and also uh, try and do some deals. So that's really what we try to do with Sync Summit. And um, since we started the first one in New York, it's uh, really taken off. We've, we've been able to grow this out to uh, several events a year, uh, two in the U.S., in New York and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, last year we had it in Paris. We moved it to London because we thought that London is more of a hub for the um, industry. And um, we're also doing um, events that are taking place in, uh, later this year in uh, Rio, in September, in Barcelona in September, and in awesome. Los Angeles in September. And then we're having another event in Munich in October. And those events are more geared towards the local or regional markets. Right. And they're usually in partnership with another company. We're also going to be doing in Singapore part of Music Matters. We're going to do a half day called oh, Sync Matters, yes. which is going to talk about the Asian market in relief. And our you know, our, our event, this coming event, is going to have some really interesting elements in it. Uh, we're going to have, uh, I believe it's going to be 16 bands that are sh going to showcase over the next two day over the two days of the event. And we're going to have um, keynotes that range from everybody from Che Pope, who is uh, Kanye West's partner in production and just one of the most storied producers of hip-hop and uh, R&B uh, over the last, I'd say, 20 years. So we have um, Jennifer Justice, who runs brands at Nation. We have Jim Brackpool, who runs uh, music for BT Sport. Uh, we have a um, number of other people coming in from the U.S. and from uh, all over Europe. Uh, to uh, speak about uh, the different aspects of the marketplace. And then we have uh, various sorts of networking that's set up uh, during the course of uh, the event. And the whole idea is that... Uh, Music supervisors and people who are on the buy side are going to be able to find new music and to help people to get educated and make new contacts that yeah. can help them to find music. And then on the other side, obviously, to help people to learn what are the best ways and means to get to music supervisors or people uh, like myself like music dealers or jingle punks who can help them to get the last mile in yeah. uh, to a uh, buyer for a project. Awesome. And, uh, and absolutely, I, I would uh, encourage people to go and check out syncsummit.com slash London. If you can't make it to the London one, I realize it's pretty soon after the release of the podcast. Yep. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of other events uh, around the world uh, for the rest of the year. And so I'm sure that you can uh, at least uh, check out what's going on. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'll be happy to drop in and out. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, excited to have an event in London because uh, in the, since uh, sort of January onwards, I haven't been able to travel because uh, as some of the listeners might know, I'm, I'm doing a, a law degree as well. As, as a show and everything else so it, it's been difficult to get to the conferences uh, uh, in the first half of the year uh, until my exams in June and, and hopefully uh, keeps it a little busy well congratulations <laughs> on that congratulations well, yeah. Uh, but yeah so oh, very excited you know. to, to have an event uh, happen in London and so uh, uh, I'll be glad to report on that and uh, uh, Chandler on your front uh, well, what's, what's happening with the, um, with the music geek services and, and Berkeley any, any exciting developments to talk about um, it's you know, it's all every day I wake up and, and you know, try to keep up on, on the trends <laughs> uh, between on? the students. Uh, we're finishing up a term uh, going into spring term, uh, I think next week with Berkeley. Yep. They're doing something interesting in that Berkeley Online, which is it's the online extension of Berkeley College of Music. And uh, I've been teaching there for three years. And we've got, so while well, we'll have, quote, so celebrity teachers like Benji Rogers is the music business trends and strategies class. Bruce Houghton of Hypebot teaches a class every once in a while. Um, and nice. so they're doing a, a something, they're going to try something in June. It's called Berkeley On Site. Uh, they're going to invite a select group of uh, like 
teachers from the, cl- uh, the college as well as some of the online teachers like Benji will be there. And they're inviting up to 200 students who may have never visited the Berkeley campus oh, great. Who, who, have, who now can get degrees. You can get actual bachelor's and master's degrees through Berkeley in music-related uh, discipline. Yeah. And I invite them to come to Boston for four days, stay in the dorm. You know, it's going to be a conference. So that, that's a pretty exciting. That's awesome. Uh, what what they have going on there and it's as far as what we got on the the music geek services and we're we're just we do a lot of uh campaigns related to direct to fan uh a lot with pledge music uh we used to use do a lot of top spin and and yeah. these days um jay and i are, are working at sort of building our brand and getting out there and uh sort of doing what we can in the with legacy artists is one of the our specialties oh, great. uh Awesome. Is is to he recently was associate producer uh, Scruffy the Cat uh, compilation by Omnivore Recordings, right? Um, and so Scruffy the Cat, a band of probably you know a, a certain size of fan base, but a very rabid fan base. So looking at digging up some of those projects as as bands from the eighties and nineties look to tap into their <clears throat> archives for, for music opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, uh, you know, so awesome. that, that's, that's, the, that's what's going on. And once again, it's music geek services.com. You can find out more information yep. about uh, what these guys do on there. And, uh, and before we go on, I would like to introduce uh, uh, an interview uh, that I recorded uh, this week uh, with the founder of sync tank, uh, Joel T. Jordan, who will also be at the sync summit. And so, uh, we'll listen to that first and then uh, continue with the show. It's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Joel T. Jordan uh, from uh, the founder of Sync Tank to the show. So hi, Joel, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Good morning. Thank you. Very good. Uh, it's great to have you, and it's a real pleasure. First time that we meet, I was saying it's, it's quite strange that we haven't crossed paths before. But uh, first of all, let's, uh, I know you guys have some news that we'll discuss, uh, uh, obviously, uh, through, the, through, the, through the show. But first of all, uh, tell us a little bit about Sync Tank in case uh, people that are listening to the show haven't heard about the company before. Sure. Um, we're a three-year-old company that uh, basically builds uh, catalog management software for labels, publishers, composers, virtually anybody with a catalog. Right. Um, so what you can do with it is manage the files, the, the inventory, all of the metadata and corresponding rights information, um, and also what it sounds like, who created it, what the recording information is, the master release information. Pretty much a granule level, atomic level um, uh, structure of, of metadata. Um, additionally, you can um, make the catalog interactive. We run it through a series of algorithms in order to tag it with additional metadata. That is um, BPM, keys, moods, um, similarities between other songs, energy levels, things like that, so that it makes the catalog searchable um, by a whole different set of criteria that is um, what, it, what the songs sound like. Awesome. Um, and then in addition, you can uh, take the catalog online and build a website around it using the same tool. Um, you can design it any which way you want. So the engine is um, you know, the, the basis of the, of the car, if you will, and you can make the body look however you, you wish. Um, so it runs the website. It helps you manage your catalog. And then in addition, you can pitch and promo through it. Great. So you can send out um, creative uh, campaigns, and that's pitching an artist page, um, album pages, news pages, playlist pages, or virtually anything. Um, so it has playlist functionality to build, um, you know, playlists very, very quickly. Yeah, and those can be sent to music supervisors. They can be sent to DJs. They can be sent to radio, um, you know, DJs. Virtually anybody that you're promoting to retail, even. Awesome. So we have a whole array of clients that use it for a number of purposes. So, yeah, whether that's they're what... getting it. Absolutely. The licensing. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, you know, it's yeah. always uh, difficult when you talk about, you know, metadata related yeah. uh, enterprises to, to make it interesting. But I think, you know, if you, if you bring it to life with one of your clients, that'd be fantastic because I think people would really uh, get it probably a little bit more. Absolutely. Yeah, we um, have uh, walked into situations where, sorry, where there is, you know, tapes on the wall and they have endeavored through that year to finally get their stuff together, you know, and to finally figure out what they have. So in some cases, they're taking it a step further. They have digitized their catalog, but sometimes right. it just says track one dot MP3 or track two dot wave or something like that. And it's not useful. So that's where we swoop in. And we've done this thing about 180 times now 
um, and can offer structure and process to a company that has been doing things forever and ever and ever this way doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way to continue doing it. Yeah. So we kind of, um, part of the service is making catalogs future proof. Yeah. Um, and whether we stick around or not is, um, is, is, uh, part of the, is, is up to them. Yeah. So we become sure. a partner to them and help them, um, that, that is those companies that are using our service, um, not only use the software, get the most out of the software, yeah. but also <laughs> offer expertise in all things metadata and all things, um, process oriented. Yeah. So what we've done is we've replicated a day's worth of work in a publisher or a label. That is, you would build a release, you'd promote a release, distribute a release, um, and then, you know, all the bits and pieces that go with it, which is the underlying data structures. Um, so we've just put it all in one box yeah. and that in order to, to drive the brand that you're promoting forward. And that's kind of the hard thing, like about uh, some of these companies or some of your clients. You know, some of the clients are probably big companies that mm-hmm. uh, were faced at one point or another with the uh, conundrum of uh, are we going to hire an IT firm to build all, all of these backend systems uh, mm-hmm. for us, or are we going to find a third party solution that can do that more efficiently than uh, we could ever do, you know, uh, in, in, as an inside system? Sure. Yeah, we have uh, face, face that conversation every day, every single time I meet a new client, um, they gauge risk versus reward and yeah. pr- and how much uh, they're willing to spend and own something um, versus um, get started today and get set up tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, some folks just uh, like to build stuff and, and usually they come back after a year or two of realizing they've poured money down the drain. Yeah. Um, it's essentially, you know, if you write a book, you don't build Microsoft Word, right? You don't go and build a typewriter. You use Microsoft Word or you use a typewriter. So we've created the Microsoft Word that we're hoping people um, realize that the benefit is to just get started and use it. And we've made it affordable enough that a large company or a small company can uh, get started very, very quickly. And we have size models to fit every size catalog and every size operation. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, me as a personal, as, as a, personally as an uh, indie label owner, and a uh, small publisher, it was just me. It was just me running my, my shop. So in order to kind of leverage the entire catalog, I needed a lever. And this is really what this thing is. It's just me- machine mechanizing the processes that I normally would do through iTunes and Dropbox and you send it and my MailChimp and jumping around creating all this work for myself really um, is inefficient. Yeah. Um, so as a force multiplier, I can act like 10 people now and get my work done and go to meetings and have more productive days and hit the studio and do all the things that really I wasn't able to do when I was running my label. Because that's what you do is you just run a label and uh, all the fun stuff sort of falls to the side. Yeah. Um, and that's not really – that's the point of the label is yeah. having fun, I think. <laughs> and do you think that uh, you know, you've only uh, – only in, in inverted commas, but you know, you've, uh, you, the company has been running for three years, as you said. And in, in this uh, relatively short time, have you already seen a shift in attitude of people towards uh, the way they need to treat the, this information? Also with the you know, increase of revenues coming from streaming services and so the need of metadata being top-notch really uh, uh, being a priority for, for a lot of labels now? Yeah, I mean, we've uh, initially approached it from the publisher side, which they've been uh, more structured with their uh, data, but not as much on the recording side. Yeah, or th- with their recordings, that is, because publishers don't really have recordings. Yeah, um, I would say that labels um, traditionally have had their stuff together a little bit more because of you know having to serve DSPs and having to have certain baseline data in order to sell the tracks. But that doesn't mean that it's not missing stuff like the other ancillary data that could push it further and into other services that um, are you know available out there that you can um, you know take advantage of it if you have writer details if you have what the thing sounds like and, and so on so yeah I have noticed that people are either freakishly responsible about it or they don't care at all it's yeah. one or the other it's there's no real middle ground um, we've given the tools in order for somebody to really take this thing all the way to the end um, you know which is what my mind works like and I really wanted a field for every single possibility that I would ever face, whether I was a label or a publisher, or I did a qu- orchestral music or punk rock. Um, it didn't matter. I just wanted to make it so that anybody that looked at it could go, oh, this is useful for me. I can ignore this. This is useful for me. I can ignore this and take it as it is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but that's a good question is I, I would say yes. Um, overall, they needed a tool in order to do this, this work. Yeah. And if the tool existed, I wouldn't have created this thing. Um, there are other tools 
out there, but they're more or less, you know, calculators. Um, we didn't want to try and build another uh, calculator. We wanted to try and make something that made the catalog presentable, um, made it interactive for anybody, even people that didn't know my catalog, and make it so that I could move through my catalog very, very quickly, yeah. um, which is primarily how it's used. It's used internally to manage process and to serve clients better, whether they're a music supervisor or a uh, retail um, you know, marketeer or whatever. Yeah, and, the, and publishing, um, publishing person is... you're sending to is relevant. Yeah, absolutely. And publishing is especially a nightmare because uh, uh, with so many acquisitions that have happened over the years, there's so much uh, mismatched the data and the publishers themselves, if they have to go and license a track, it might take them a day or two to find out who owns which shares of what and just find the contracts and all that, by which point they might actually lose a sync. So in this yeah, way, they, they don't. You've pointed out a great, a great problem that uh, people have is, is they're unable to access everything because there's a system that was created 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that's on a mainframe or exists on some guy's desktop. Um, and that's it. And you have to poke that person in order to get that information. And, and by then you don't know what you're, you know, if you're going to win the gig or not. So speed is of the essence. Um, I've gotten many license deals done just because I got there first. They were looking for something very specific. I had that very specific thing and I got there first. Um, so if you look at this as a a way to just get through the day faster. That's what it is. It's just like uh, hammers and nails don't make you a good carpenter. This won't make you a good promoter. It's just a, a really way, a really great way to put it all into one box yeah. and do all the things that you're already doing. And talking about uh, sort of working with smaller operations as well, uh, the, the the news stories that I was uh, the story that I was talking about at the beginning of the show was mm -hmm. the fact uh, that uh, a Sound Gizmo you launched Sound Gizmo, which is sort of like a, a scaled down version to a certain extent, or you know a, a version that is applicable to smaller operations. And so, right. how did that come about, and and uh, uh, and uh, how did that concept evolve? Well, initially, <clears throat> when we were creating this thing, we decided to build the the Porsche. You know, the very full tricked out everything you'd possibly ever need and we're continuing to build that product that's that's sync tank that's our enterprise level product yeah um and it does way more than just sync obviously we we started in in licensing which is why we came up with that name um but sound gizmo is more or less the everything product and it's for um primarily focused on labels and, and individuals so that is you know small houses of of uh you know, of, of people working together, two or three folks, maybe one. And um, in order to kind of reach that market, we had to kind of rip out a lot of the things that were expensive yeah. and that we found were expensive to support, which are um, enterprise level functionalities that a single user would never really need. Um, and so in, in doing that, we just focused on the core, the core functionality. That is what it, what is it we, we really needed to do. We needed to manage the system. We needed to, um, create the website and, and run the website. Um, we need it to pitch and promote, and we need it to sell and license. So we've included all of those basic tools, um, which is, you know, the core. Yeah. Um, and we've put it under, um, you know, it's around 49 quid a month. So uh, virtually anybody can afford that. And um, it gives you everything that you normally would be used to in a website, um, blog news, uh, et cetera. And, you know, the artist pages, album pages, track pages, playlists, and, and the lot. Plus, there's a way to sell directly to consumers, um, either okay. MP3 downloads, streams, or licenses. And we've also incorporated um, an automated mechanism so that you can create these licenses instantly, depending on what the selections are, and push those instant licenses out. So there's no reason that um, a, a catalog that's really um, marketable can't monetize themselves. Um, this is really about doing it yourself and enabling folks to better market their catalog and have a place to showcase everything in one spot. Um, so to that end, we just dialed back the price uh, considerably and yeah. we made it set up yourself and all the automated stuff that we had intended to do ages ago. Um, we've just been focused on these massive, massive clients that are, are wonderful to work with, but there are so many more people out there that really need these tools. And, um, that I feel for and <laughs> running a label that I know um, this can change the way they they op operate. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and so, and I guess you know the interesting thing here is that we're looking at a, a landscape where uh, a, la a smaller operation wouldn't have to necessarily go to an aggregator to uh, uh, sell 
mm-hmm. their music for, for sync purposes, they could actually do it themselves, which would make it more efficient from a cost, cost perspective as well. Considerably. And, you know, obviously it takes connections yeah. and it takes uh, skills to market. So, um, you know, that's not always the right route for everybody. But um, if it's a, a house that has or, or a shop that has um, considerable connections or good marketing skills, then, yeah, the sky's the limit. Um, but consider that labels already outside of sync need to promote to, you know, a duff, no, numerous endpoints. And they do it again and again and again for every single release and every single artist in order to build the brand. Yeah. But then sending anonymous links or people to SoundCloud doesn't really drive your brand forward. So if you bring them back to your your bubble, your your world of music, they can see, you know, the vastness of the catalog, why a band is important to work with or not. Um, they're really giving them a place to see your story. It's your it's your book. Yeah. So um, think of this as a virtual dossier for your entire music collection and your entire label operation, and then it you know comes into focus on on how this thing can be useful. Nice. And and I also would point people to check out the blog of Sync Tank. It's blog.synctank.com <coughs> where there's a a bunch of really interesting uh, interviews and articles. Uh, the latest one is uh, with uh, there's an extensive interview with the PlayStation Music Supervisor Lindsay Smith. Uh, and uh, and yeah, uh, Joel, a uh, real pleasure having you on the show today. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks very much for having me. Appreciate it. A couple more stories before we wrap up the show. But first of all, uh, first of all, I wanted to talk uh, about uh, sort of the, the battle uh, around the consoles and music. So we've seen a couple of interesting th- developments this week. First of all, uh, the PlayStation and uh, a deal with Spotify has gone live. So essentially, PlayStation has replaced its uh, own uh, a Sony Music Unlimited service with a, a PlayStation Music service, which is actually powered by Spotify, which is very interesting. Uh, and so uh, essentially, they admitted defeat on that particular. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. you know, t- trial, and uh, you know, I remember the the press conference back in at Medium a few years ago when they launched the project. It was it was a very big deal with the Rob Wells there and a bunch of other people, but it didn't work out. But they admitted defeat and they ended up partnering with Spotify, which makes sense. And uh, the Spotify guys actually yesterday tweeted that the app has already been installed one and a half million times in just one day. So that's that's a pretty impressive stat considering that it, it went live in 41 territories uh, uh, simultaneously, and uh, we know just how many hundreds of millions of PlayStation that are out there, uh, PlayStation 3s and 4s. So uh, a very interesting move for Spotify. On the other hand, we've seen uh, uh, Microsoft that has pulled uh, uh, the Xbox uh, uh, sort of uh, branding from the music and video apps in the latest uh, iteration of the demo apps that were powered by, on a Windows 10. So users that are demoing Windows 10 at the moment, which is going to be released later this year, have seen that the music and video app now don't feature the Xbox branding anymore. So maybe Microsoft feels uh, safe enough or, or you know, uh, in a good place with its mobile devices and, and you know Windows 10 and everything that's happening with, with the ultra portable com- computer to take that Xbox running out and sort of uh, go out on its own and, and hopefully uh, make some waves uh, without the support of that really powerful brand on the gaming side so uh, uh, Chandler on, on your end you know how do you feel about this these movements in the, in the gaming space do you think that uh, you know a partnership with PlayStation for example can t- uh, move the needle when it comes to adoption of, of premium uh, streaming services I, I think it's a smart move on Spotify's part and probably on PlayStation, you know, with, with obviously it's not all a younger demographic. Uh, it, it definitely is getting Spotify brand uh, into the, you know, sort of the minds of the younger, the people who can afford the time to play the video games sure. or at least, you know, but I also think, at a certain point, somebody has to look and say, why are we building, why are we pouring money in to build something we could just partner with Spotify and get it done? You know, <laughs> it's a, getting rid of their own service. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and Spotify has the money to throw around to probably, uh, <laughs> to probably just, you know, offer them a, a, you know, can't resist deal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Mark, an interesting angle on, on this story actually on the sync side because uh, uh, what's interesting about the, the Spotify PlayStation app is the fact that uh, gamers are going to be able to play any track from Spotify as a background to their games uh, whilst they play. So this is interesting because you know uh, up to a few years ago uh, there were some very very strict lines uh, that were being drawn between what was a sync and what wasn't a sync, and and sort of and, right. and music companies were quite defensive around that. But it seems like that kind of defensiveness has had to relent a little bit because uh, these kind of things make sense, right? 
Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's probably some kind of, if you want to talk about a license, it's probably some kind of a black license that, uh, you know, was carved out between um, Sony and uh, Spotify in order to make this work. I mean, the mechanics right. are possible. But in terms of uh, in terms of bringing more choice to the consumer, it just seems like a natural thing. I mean, I think that at the end, um, you know, Sony is looking at any band any can to keep people going to their console versus somebody else's, and this is certainly one of them, allowing you to customize your music the way you want. Now, I think the other side of it is that from a creative point of view, depending on the game, there are certain things that, uh, you know, from a musical point of view, people want it to have on the, uh, you know, the people who produce it want to have on the, uh, uh, on the game. But overall, I think it's something that, uh, you know, it's just really seeing... Sony looking at this and saying, okay, we're going to give ourselves a greater advantage and we're going to give the consumer more choice. Yeah. And you know, there was something I wanted to say, and I'm sorry, I'm taking it back to, um, taking it back to a uh, title for a second, but um, yeah, I have uh, one of my friends is uh, David Hyman, who, as you know, I think, you know, started Mog. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I asked him for his opinion on uh, what went on with title yesterday. And he said, there's more choice for the consumer, and it's always a good thing. Also, I think it puts pressure on Apple, Beats, and YouTube to have sound, higher sound quality options. I think that's a great thing, and I don't think that the world should only be limited to Spotify, Apple, and Google. So from the founder of Mog, I think that's kind of interesting, and I, he's also a big audiophile, so of course he's yeah. going to say the thing about the higher sound quality. <laughs> but I thought that was just an interesting thing to sort of put in there. I hope you don't mind. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Actually, uh, I'd ask David if he wanted to join the show today because uh, he's just launched a new uh, exciting venture called Chosen. So it's a new music game that's kind of like an awesome. X-Factor style, <laughs> uh, but uh, without, you know, it, it's entirely virtual. So essentially, uh, the, the, the interesting play on, on that Chosen is that it's chosen.fm if anybody wants to go and, ch and take a look but it's a, a closed beta right now so you have to uh, request access to get in uh, so essentially uh, the big play is that it's more focused on the judges than on the actual performers which is uh, quite funny I think because obviously there's more people that are willing to be judges than are willing to be performers on the service but if you right. are performers you, you can also uh, record your own performance and obviously you get put through the paces and, and people can comment on, on, on what you've done and hopefully there won't be too, too much trolling on, on, on the game because that could really uh, ruin it for everybody uh, but uh, but it's, it's a very interesting proposition it's exciting because it, it feels like there's a little bit more of excitement going into music games right now so that in, in that sense uh, maybe that's actually a topic that will come up at the sync summit uh, next week uh, because we have rock band coming back and we got yeah. zaya that's that's got their own game we got we got a, a bunch of different companies that are trying to get back into music gaming so that it, it would be nice to see a bit more revenue come in for, from that from that point of view right Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think that yeah, it's it's apps apps to me are really where it's where it's at in the long term in terms of uh, revenue generation. It's it's, a, it's natural. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that it's interesting, and that we're trying to figure out how to make money as artists, or trying to figure out for artists how to make money from streaming. When over in the sync area, uh, no one's worrying about how to make money with syncs. They're worrying about how to get syncs. You know, it's like. You know, put some effort into that. It's it's a topic that comes up a lot with artists in in the in the Berkeley classes. Is how do I get started? And we we tend to refer them to an article that Emily White wrote about where she talks about music dealers and jingle punks and and the like. Um, so it's always it's a topic that you know it's sort of an untapped. I think for a lot of smaller artists, an untapped resource is is the opportunity to get their music utilized and paid for rather than just streamed. Yeah. I mean that's something that we can we could for a whole nother hour. But also yeah. Chandler, if you need if just to help to get out the word or help to connect with people for what you're doing at Berkeley, I'll just say right now I'll make myself available and Andrea will give you my contact. But cool. uh, in terms of uh, in terms of sync, you know I could get into stories where there's an artist who's unsigned who has a good Facebook and Twitter following who ends up making a really nice living because their music is really syncable just based yeah. on the sync. And the sync has also led to them being supported on their tour, on endorsements, and bigger relationships. So, right. you know, learning how to do it right, learning how to properly connect with people can really help you as an artist to grow through sync. I mean, I see sync as not just a payday itself, but also as a fulcrum to grow audience and other revenue streams.
it's another conversation yeah yeah absolutely yep. Yeah. Yep. and uh, there's so many songs that you know i was watching uh, uh, a couple of series recently and, and and they were old series like from two or three years ago and they they uh, they both had a lot of songs that i recognize from uh, more recent releases to a certain recent uh, inverted commas but in the sense that the sync was done early on before the track became huge and and right. like a lot of these things that happen and you listen back to that to the episode from like four years ago and you think oh wow this track was on, on there but it, it was only big like two years later and so it kind of like it's funny to to look at that timeline as well of how how hits evolve it takes such a long time in the u.s especially to to break a song that from the time you get one sync to the time it actually hits uh, major radios it could be like you know 12 18 uh, 20 four months uh, so very very interesting timings there and and finally i wanted to touch upon uh, coachella so uh, coachella has renewed its partnership with the youtube to live stream the festival but they're taking it one step further so now there's going to be three uh, uh, live streams from the event uh, there's uh, the opportunity to do like a, a virtual avatar and you can uh, you know uh, check out an interactive schedule check out the interactive profiles of the artists so a lot of stuff happening around that uh, obviously not the same as being at the festival but if you couldn't get a ticket or, or you, you wanted to see what was going on at Coachella, it's definitely worth checking out uh, uh, towards the end of April. Um, you know, I, I was I was kind of joking around that if you uh, if you do this next year and, and you manage to integrate, because YouTube has have just integrated support for the 360 degree videos. Mm -hmm. uh, if you start doing 360 degree live streaming yeah. and, and you you have like a little uh, Oc Oculus Rift uh, uh, kit when they come out uh, yeah. at the end of 2015, it's going to become essentially like a virtual festival experience. And I wonder at that point. Uh, 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 you know, if that is going to start to look like a little bit of a replacement for, for being there. Obviously, now it's not looking at a laptop screen. is uh, nothing like it. But if you can actually turn your head around and, and, and look at what's going on and look at the crowd, that could be a, a, an interesting an interesting thing and, and perhaps a little bit threatening to festival organizers to a certain extent. <laughs> we shall see what happens. Yeah, uh, unless they monetize it. <laughs> yeah, unless they monetize it, obviously, like which is pr very likely. But in any case, you know, we haven't seen any VR kits really work yet. So uh, it's going to take a while for this to happen. And, and uh, Right. I think uh, we're getting towards the end of the show. Uh, uh, guys, anything else that you'd seen or you wanted to talk about? Uh, otherwise, I think we can wrap it up. Mark? No, um, I mean, you know, if you want to go to if you want to go to one of our events, you can check out SyncSummit.com. And also, you can take a look at the year ahead. We have discounts, which I'll give everybody on a special page, which is nice. SyncSummit.com. And that's S-Y-N-C, Summit, one word, dot com, slash cyber c-y-b-e-r and Great. you can check out what we have coming up on our um basically on our rundown of uh events this year uh again you know thank you so much andrea and uh thank you so much conversation i could talk about you know what i think is yeah. wrong about <laughs> powers to be honest with you guys i think it's such a dog but anyway, know, it's, it is it is bad know. i mean uh <laughs> there, there, there's a couple of interesting quotes here that I, I, I dear marked, uh, and uh, one of the best ones was from uh, Duncan Gear, who's uh, uh, often often a guest on the show, who wrote on uh, um, uh, Tech Radar. Uh, in short, the world looks today title is a terrible proposition. It's like selling snake oil, sharing the profits with the richest artists alone, and the only way it's going to be able to get market share is by screwing over consumers by withholding catalogs from other services. <laughs> yeah. So that was a very interesting uh, sum up sum up of, of title from him. Uh, and and there's good points there, but obviously it's not all bad. And Chandler, from, from your end, obviously it's musicgeekservices.com. Uh, uh, anything else you want to mention? I, that's about it. I put out a, a weekly newsletter that you could check out uh, through oh, yeah. musicgeekservices.com. Uh, it's it's born out of uh, necessity, keeping in touch with students, but now it's up to like... I think there's over 600 people, and it's just a weekly sort of a curation inspired by uh, Darren at Daily Digest, sort of an Americanized version, uh, some more towards the the student end, but it's useful. I, you know, it's a useful way for me to keep track of stuff and, and go back and so share it with people. But uh, I wanted to comment on Coachella in that yeah, of course. The, the live streams, on, on the face of it, they sound really interesting when you – when you sit in front of your computer and watch them, they're boring. Tend to do is I'll turn it on and put it through some speakers so like so while I'm doing stuff, and it's pretty interesting. I, fi I find it worth listening to versus not listening to it. You know, catching some some stream. I live near Lollapalooza, but I won't go near it, and I'm glad they stream <laughs> it because because I can see it. You know, I'm more of a solid right. sound style festival, but. Um, 
you know, I, I really, I, if it was a little bit more engaging somehow, I don't know how it could be. There's a, the company Live One. Yeah. They've got their crowd surfing app. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see how, if they're utilized in any of these festivals. But uh, I like to go back and watch. The thing that frustrated me the most last year for Coachella was the replacements didn't stream their set. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I, pro- I probably, I don't know if I it, it, when it comes down to it, but if it was like ninety nine cents or four nine, being paid for it, you know, Billy Joe uh, Armstrong from Green Day was with them, and Paul Westerberg during one of the sets was lying on a couch. That would have made for interesting, you know, an interesting watch at the least. Yeah, yeah I mean, it feels like there's more room for YouTube to experiment with uh, uh, added. Uh things that maybe people might want to pay for because obviously youtube is still trying to figure out what the hell they're going to do with monetization so uh so maybe there's there's an option opportunity there to pay for something and or backstage backstage access or something and and have yeah. a bit more interactivity on that end uh well very interesting and that that is it from me as well uh you can find out more on digitalmusictrends.com obviously the show comes out every week and uh, uh that is uh, you can also check out the dmt one to one uh on digitalmusictrends.com and uh, follow through the links on that i have moved the site over to a new server so if you experience any issues with the site this week please give me a shout and i can i'm gonna try and straighten them out as soon as possible thanks so much for listening and thanks guys for joining me today have a fantastic week and until next time